All right, uh, welcome everyone. Um, today I am pleased to introduce Dr. Svetimir Markovich um, to give a talk to us here at today's uh, seminar. Um, Dr. Markovich did his MD and PhD at the Medical College of Pennsylvania, after which he did a residency and clinical fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, where he is now professor of medicine, professor of oncology, and a consultant in the divisions of hematology and medical oncology. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Markovich very briefly when I was a graduate student at Mayo, and um, in addition to his many accolades as a clinician scientist, um, two things sort of stood out to me. One was his commitment to mentorship, so he has mentored over 30 trainees and was last year designated as the mentor of the year by Mayo's Center for Clinical and Translational, Sci Translational Sciences, um, and the second is his sort of team science approach. He's definitely not the type of guy who's planning on doing everything himself. He builds himself a really strong team, um, including a collaborator from NASA who happened to land the Mars rover, which is pretty cool. Um, so he's all about kind of, you know, getting the right team together and very committed to um, making that an impact on patients. So today he's going to speak with us about his work in immunotherapy for melanoma. So thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think I'm a little overdressed. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I love your new building, by the way. I mean, this is this is really beautiful, and uh, I, I I wish we at Mayo don't have this. We have silos, but we don't have nice buildings like this. Uh, the reason, uh, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm I'm basically, you guys, I'm sort of what 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 passes on as a, I see patients half of my time, and I, I try to do science the other half, which is why I have to build teams of multiple different experts so that I can be better at what I do. And what, I'll hope, what I was hoping to do for you this morning is kind of give you a, a walkthrough uh, sort of through the, 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 the realm of research that our program does, and primarily our lab, uh, by which we hope to learn how to treat malignancy with immunologic uh, tools. And I, I do melanoma, and so everything I, I talk about will be in the realm of malignant melanoma. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of a history of the natural, of sort of what, what is malignant melanoma, tell you somewhat about the advances in therapeutics in this disease, which uh, William Osler, who some of you know is the father of modern medicine, refers to melanoma of the cancer that gives cancer a bad name. This was up until 2010, a malignancy that was uniformly fatal in its metastatic state with survival times uh, at less than, less than a year, 100% of the time. Uh, so there's been a lot happening. I, I'm a basic, I was trained as a basic immunologist, so I'll emphasize uh, immunotherapy. And then most of my talk is really try to sort of uh, share with you what, how we think uh, potentially this could be treated better uh, and how potentially science can be applied. And, you know, in its most fundamental, I'm just an applied scientist. You know, I basically try and find out what my basic scientist colleagues do sort of beg and borrow from them and try to do it in the clinic to make Mrs. Jones live better. So a little bit of an introduction uh, about malignant melanoma. So uh, the tumor itself is induced by a physical carcinogen, which is why malignant melanoma is one of those malignancies that has thousands upon thousands of mutations. Uh, it's UV radiation to the skin. The melanocytes in the skin are constantly in a proliferative mode when one is exposed to UV radiation. The genome is unwound. Uh, DNA mutations occur. A melanoma as a malignancy is really a DNA tumor that carries between 1,000 to 20,000 mutations on average patient. The tumor has a very uh, sort of a predictable uh, invasion pattern. It starts at the, at the dermoepidermal junction uh, where the melanocytes live. The melanocyte is the cell of neuroectodermal origin that inhabits the skin that produces melanin. Uh, once these cells get mutated, they start uh, invading deeper and deeper into the layers of the skin where there is a richer nutritious environment where the capillaries and the blood supply of the skin exist. And from there into the lymphatics, from where they metastasize into the uh, sentinel lymph node. And the reason for this is there is this sort of this very anatomically restricted pattern of invasion into the skin. And once uh, access to lymphatic capillaries in the deeper layers of the skin is acquired, the tumor metastasizes to its anatomically predictable first, anat first lymph node that drains the lymphatic fluid from that primary site. So we have a very clear connection from the tumor to the immune system within the human natural disease. 
Once the tumor uh, inhabits the sentinel lymph node, it divides from there and metastasizes beyond to the collecting uh, ducts and ultimately through blood. And this is a positron image, uh, a PET scan of a patient where these black spots represent areas of metastatic malignant melanoma throughout the body. This is the terminal scenario where life is 99% uh, of patients prior to 2010 will die of this disease if they're ever diagnosed with this. So this is uh, why I went to school and why I do what I do. So what, in 2010, uh, this was really the, the options of treatment that we had in this disease. Uh, median survival, overall survival for these patients was nine months, which practically means if you saw somebody uh, for the first time on around Thanksgiving, that patient had a 50-50 chance of catching Thanksgiving next year with their families if diagnosed. Uh, since tw uh, in 2016, the options are many more, and the median survival time of this patient population is now up to 24 months. Uh, this is a tectonic shift in, in this disease that happened around 2011, primarily driven by the discovery of immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, as well as targeted therapeutics targeting the BRAF mutations uh, in the RAS-RAF MEK signaling pathway. So what the, the thing that's probably made the most uh, shift in the survival curves in this disease has really been cancer immunotherapy. So as many of you know, the, the story, the history of immunotherapy is, is very long. Ever since William Coley invented Coley's toxin back in 1883, uh, just sort of for a point of reference, this is when uh, uh, Albert Einstein uh, was still in high school back in those days. Uh, you know, Coley's toxin was an injection of a bacterial culture into a tumor uh, that regressed due to massive inflammation. The idea that the immune system can somehow control the immune, uh, can control cancer has been off and on. In the 1970s, uh, Time Magazine had a front cover, uh, which I used for my thesis defense when I was a graduate student, uh, which was the interferon as the if drug of cancer. Only if interferon, we, we all thought cancer would be cured with interferon. So this story that immunity can, can cure cancer has been along for a very long time. Uh, but of late, we, can, we are really starting to see some benefit from it. And the, the unique feature about immunotherapeutics is, unlike conventional forms of cancer therapy that act directly on the tumor, immunotherapeutics, by and large, uh, work via proxy. You know, they, they work via something else, which is the host immune system, that ultimately then attacks and destroys the tumor. Since the last five to six years, there's been a lot of talk about immunotherapeutics. And I think, you know, all you need to do is, like, watch Monday Night Football, and one of the commercials is going to be about Optivo. You know, now the pharmaceutical industry can, can, can advertise commercial, can advertise drugs. There's been a lot of talk. You know, uh, President Carter uh, was a beneficiary of, of one of these treatments, as have been many others. And in 2013, science uh, front cover was the biggest achievement of science. Uh, was in fact immunotherapy at that time. So that's all well and good, but unfortunately for those of us that live in the trenches, you know, this really works in only one out of five patients. So, you know, this is substantially better than what we used to have prior to this. But still, you know, four out of those five patients will succumb to metastatic melanoma, will succumb to lung cancer, will succumb to bladder cancer, will succumb to all of these other malignancies for which these drugs are increasingly almost at lightning speed receiving FDA approvals as they target multiple aspects of immunity. And the question really is, uh, for me, and when this was all developing, I was fortunate to be involved in some of the early developments of this on the clinical side, you know, can, can we use this incremental uh, step to take advantage for a leap forward? You know, can we, can we or have we really reached the end of the beginning in cancer immunotherapeutics? And can we learn from what the, the successes, the true successes are, not successes through various data reinterpretation and, you know, all the fancy statistics that we can do to interpret clinical results. But can the real successful outcomes in this field be used to learn from them and then leap forward into much more effective therapeutics? And I, I think so. And hopefully uh, how we do this is to compartmentalize the big problem of immunity and cancer and compartmentalize it into smaller problems, as we would address any, any issue in, in, in science or in medicine? And can we use all of science, and not just biology and medicine, and in, in a few minutes I'll tell you why that may not be sufficient, uh, in, to our advantage to move 
this highly complex, highly regulated, temporally and spatially distributed, differentially controlled system called the immune system to the behest of, 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 the, the, of the host against the tumor. So what I'll try to do, you guys, in, in the next few minutes is really sort of walk you through compartments in which we are investing substantial resources of the story of melanoma and immunity and how we hope to understand the interactions between the cancer and the host immune system and, and lear learn from those interactions to develop better treatments. So the first question is, uh, how do we, what, what is the tumor immune interface? You know, what makes up a tumor? You know, I, I feel patients' tumors all the time. Anywhere between 20 and 40% of the tumor mass are not cancer cells. And the, the first question that, that I had about a decade ago now, actually more than that, is can we really see all that is happening uh, where immunity faces cancer? You know, at some point, you must, there, there has to be a situation where, you know, uh, you know, immune cell one sees cancer cell one and says, well, how are you? You know, what do we do here? Uh, you know, uh, but the truth is we really can't do it very well uh, in today's world. And, you know, I live in, 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 in human cancer world, so, you know, I treat humans with cancer. I used to be a mouse immunologist, and I can tell you, in 1988, we cured metastatic melanoma. Uh, have been trying to do it <laughs> ever since in a human, in a biped. Uh, so how we conventionally study the tumor immune interface is using histology. You know, it's essentially taking pieces of, of tissue, putting them under microscope, and then using immunofluorescence, immunohistochemical methods, uh, and trying to stain various uh, compartments of, of the various cells on this slide here. Uh, this is, of course, the melanoma, and here is the border where it touches uh, sort of inflammatory cells. And most of the time we can do this for one, maybe two parameters uh, in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a way that we can see their relative location, not grinding them up in solution, but actually seeing where they are. So this is immunohistochemistry for CD3. And you can see sort of a variety of brown staining cells here at the periphery uh, of the tumor and nothing really inside. So if all we had to do is this kind of data, our conclusions would not be very very, very deep. But what if I told you that one can stain up to 200 different immune parameters, 200 different biomarkers for each individual cell in this field, and if you can do it for every cancer cell and every immune cell that is facing a tumor in a human after it's been receptive surgery. So that's basically what we can do today. In a collaboration with Michael Gertis at GE Life Science, we've over the last five to six years, we've helped develop a, a, immuno, a platform by which uh, we can serially stain it with immunofluorescence uh, now about 350, 360 different uh, immunologic phenotypes and signaling pathways and so forth, uh, and be able to anatomically locate it by, by simply iteratively staining uh, for one biomarker, saving the fluorescent image, inactivating the fluorescence, staining with another antibody, saving the fluorescent image, iteratively staining and stacking those images up to 200. We can do it very easily up to 60 and 70. Uh, 200 is the, is the limit. And one of the staggering things that absolutely frightened me when I first saw this data is look at the in inhomogeneity of the various compartments of one little two centimeter tumor as vis-a-vis -vis the, the presence of infiltration of immune cells. Uh, and I'm not even gonna tell you what the different colors represent. Suffice it to say, you know, these are di the, the, what lights up our different immune cells. And you can imagine if you took a biopsy of this piece and extracted the RNA, got an RNA signature of this, you would likely get a more inflamed signature than if you biopsy something that does not have any penetrating immune cells. So the, the topographical relationships of the human immune cell uh, system interface is important. So we know this. Well, how do we take better advantage of this knowledge? So we started looking at ways in which, you know, can we statistically analyze the relative relationships, the distance, the proximity versus the distance between immune cells of certain characteristics versus cancer cells of certain characteristics? You know, the simple example, very popular in our field right now, is PDL1 expressing tumor cells and PD1 receptor positive T cells that may or may not be apoptotic. Could something like that be done? And could statistical analysis could, to that be done beyond just clustering? As it turns out, there's a whole field 
of spatial statistics that exists out there that's uh, used primarily in, in the field of ecology and forestry that we have, have been fortunate to work with an investigator at the University of South Florida who is a member of the National Academy of Science. We actually just developed a lot of these technologies. So we are now trying to understand the statistical relationships between different forms of uh, immune, different features of immune cells with different features of cancer cells. And what we've also been able to do is devise a method by which we can select out uh, phenotypically sharing cells within the tumor microenvironment, use a laser capture microdissection laser, and pull out those tissues for mass spec uh, analysis, and be able to concentrate the signal of the relevant interactions driven by the proximity versus distance of different cancer cells and immune cells, and really try to understand what is signal and not something that could be drowned out by background, uh, which is far more present than the actual success. Because remember, the fact that there is a tumor means that immunity has failed, but it's not uniformly failed. Can we understand by the areas where immunity may still be holding a foothold, can we understand what works there and what doesn't work here to devise better treatments? And one of the first experiments that we're doing right now, and fortunately we, we, we still got a little grant from the NIH, I'm not sure how long they'll be doing that, uh, is, uh, is, is basically we found a very interesting association between with class, uh, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, we voted. Uh, it is, uh, is this is, is uh, uh, the, it turns out that HLA class one is a very profound driver of, of the character of T cell infiltrates within the tumor and trying to understand that is something that's uniquely made possible uh, by, by, these, uh, by this new technology. So ability to study the tumor microenvironment in a much more profound way using methodology brought from a different field uh, may be something that will lead, lead us to the, to the next step. The, six, the next question is, well, you know, what I've shown you right now is a profound analysis of a very static picture. But some immunotherapeutics work. Uh, a lot of patients get some benefit from immunotherapy early on, and then treatments fail. So there is a temporal d domain to all of this. You know, immunity sort of works and then doesn't work, or maybe doesn't work and then works. So is there a way for us to maybe visualize the immune system without taking somebody's liver out, looking at it under a microscope, and then putting it back in? You know, I've got a lot of friends that are surgeons in Mayo. You know, Mayo brothers were surgeons, so we have surgeons everywhere over there. But not even they would let me do that. So, you know, so can we create a molecule that can tag the immune system, uh, immune cells invading cancer? And can we actually see this outside of the body? You know, can we, can we visualize uh, the, the effector arm of the immune system going in to fight the tumor uh, in such a way that we can quantify uh, what's going on in a, in a temporal way. So from today to tomorrow, we treat every three weeks. Maybe, you know, uh, one week, seven hours, and 20 minutes later, something happens different that is different from immediately after treatment. So it turns out we can. Uh, after 15 years of week of work, we can. Uh, and we basically, uh, with a collaboration with a group in La Sapienza in Rome, uh, and if those who haven't been, definitely put it on your bucket list. Rome, good place to visit. Uh, we basically tagged interleukin-2, recombinant IL-2. Remember, all modern immunotherapy of cancer uh, is based on T cells infiltrating tumors, CD8-positive cytotoxic T lymph cells. So what if we could label uh, the IL-2 receptor, CD25, with radio-labeled interleukin-2 with technetium-99, which would emit uh, uh, gamma rays that we can actually see from a, a gamma camera outside of the patient? And could we actually see tumor infiltrating lymphocytes as they penetrate the tumor in a human undergoing cancer immunotherapy. A few years ago, we, uh, we had a grant from the NCI uh, where we developed and primarily tested technetium-99 uh, bound to interleukin-2, uh, and we can basically identify hot and cold tumors. We did this only in five patients. Uh, the biopsies of the hot lesion demonstrates a swarm of CD3-positive T cells. The cold lesion, this is basically where the tumor is. This is the periphery of the tumor. Had very no infiltrates. Many cells, good outcome. Few cells, bad outcome. The, the, in the treatment was unable to push immune cells into the tumor. Uh, what they did in the tumor, this method will not tell me that. But at least it shows me a functional difference that we went for, for trafficking. This is primarily a trafficking tool 
that we can actually see penetration of IL-2 receptor expressing cells. So we recently uh, got FDA approval uh, to test this in a large clinical trial uh, that will be activated this fall, where we will truly try to understand and bring the former technology I showed you with the multi-omic multiparametric analysis of tissues uh, in with the visualization, the external visualization of tumor filtration by lymphocytes to make an adjudication as to whether one treatment works or not, and to who is benefited from this kind of therapy. So, question number three. How do metastasis begin? And you know, I'm, I was born and raised on the idea that, uh, you know, immunity is critical to cancer. You know, all that mutation stuff that geneticists do, yeah, that's fine and all, but if, if the immune system could take care of it, everybody goes home happy. You know, uh, if that were true, as, as many have pointed out in my career, well then how does cancer metastasize via the lymphatic system? At which point, I would then kind of shut up and go, go, go do something else. I would read a paper or something, you know, sit at my desk and, and ponder. So finally, I had enough time in my life to actually finally test it. You know all those things on your bucket list? You finally have a chance to study something you've always wanted to do. Uh, so we said, well, 90% of solid tumors metastasize via the very lymphatic system that we're hoping to use to fight cancer. You know, and I was not about to give in to my genetics friends, you know, <laughs> to, that, that they were right and I was always wrong. So we, we, we started studying uh, the, the, remember that sentinel lymph node? So remember, melanoma dives deep into the skin. It accesses the lymphatic channels of, of the dermoepidermal junction, actually of, of the dermis, from which they metastasize into the lymph nodes. And that first sentinel lymph node, uh, is really the first uh, component of the immune system that we can that is receptive to metastasis. Melanoma almost all, virtually always goes from the primary tumor, enters to the sentinel lymph node, from where it metastasizes beyond. And about 20% of the time, when a primary melanoma is resected, at least in our practice, and we, we have a very high risk practice uh, for melanoma, uh, the sentinel lymph node is positive, but 80% of the time it's negative. So the first, but in, in about 10 years, eight years ago, we published a paper that said immunohistochemically, in a very simplistic way, whether the tumor had cancer in it or not, whether the lymph node had cancer cells in it or not, the basic parameters of the absence or presence of T cells, uh, macrophages, TH2 polarized, uh, 1, 2 polarized helper cells, was uh, exactly the same, both fundamentally different from uh, lymph nodes that were inactive, uh, sort of control lymph nodes that we take off from the, from the thyroid gland. So something must be happening before the cancer cells ever make it to the lymph node, preparing that lymph node that outnumbers the number of cancer cells that come in like a bazillion to one. You know, how, so something happens ahead of the metastatic cells surviving in there that sort of prepare the soil using our good old Minnesota terms, you know, to, for the seed of cancer to, to invade. So we started looking to these things called extracellular vesicles. Um, uh, the melanoma, is a high, the, as, as the tumor invades deeper into the layers of the skin, the tumor itself becomes profoundly hy hypoxic. Years ago, I did, I did some research in, in uh, sort of angiogenesis, uh, and we had the tools in the lab to study this. There's a actually hypoxic gradient in this, and we postulated that uh, cells exposed to hypoxic conditions actually produce extracellular vesicles and exosomes that they secrete. This, this can be done. People have published on this. We've seen this. Uh, and the question was, could we capture these extracellular vesicles from the channel that connects downstream from the tumor into the, the sentinel lymph node? Can we actually get them out of this lymphatic channel that is a hair-like projection uh, that would technically bring in these mediators of immunosuppression into the lymph node. So, like I said, Mayo's got a lot of surgeons, and, you know, some of them uh, did some work in our lab, uh, and we basically developed a microdissection technique, a microcapillary dissection technique that they did in the operating room to pull out the, uh, this, these hair-like projections, which are the uh, afferent lymphatic channels feeding the sentinel lymph node, They're directly connecting the primary tumor. And we can, on electron microscopy, identify these spherules that are between 30 and 70 nanometers in size. And what we were able to do is extract both the, the fluid 
uh, the, sphere, the, the spheres of the extracellular vesicles uh, versus the non-vesicle fluid and run mass spectrometry on this. And we're starting to uh, basically select, and this is an ongoing clinical study right now, we're, uh, we, we are finding that most of these mediators that are packaged within these uh, vesicles appear to have down-regulatory properties to monocytoid function, to myeloid cell function, to potentially drive down a bias immunity to the Th2 side, which is what we've seen uh, in sort of more gross analysis of these cells. And we have uh, identified sort of the first candidate molecule in the extra cargo that is shared among at least 30 different patients who, in whom we've done it. This is an ongoing clinical study. We're, in, we're building out the database as to what all these uh, particles are doing uh, in here. There's many of them. There's roughly about 1,200 that we can identify by mass spec. About 70 are shared uh, about, um, among all the patients that we've studied, and the vast majority of them signal or have functional activity that is suppressive of sort of T cell activation, things that we think of are important in destroying cancer. So there, there is a, there's a story to this. Uh, that remains to be told that our first candidate is really a, the first candidate to which we are now trying to develop countermeasures. You know, can we develop active therapeutics to block these things? So, the second question, of course, was well, if this is what happens in the sentinel lymph node, remember the could, could could this be true for the whole body? You know, cancer ultimately kills somebody because it disseminates everywhere else. If it only went to a lymph node, we cut it out. Everybody goes home happy. It's not an issue. But is, is this type of immune regulation uh, a problem systemically and not only in, in the lymph node? And the long and short of it is, yes, it is. In patients with metastatic melanoma, uh, many years ago we published this paper where we looked at uh, about the 70-some-odd things that we could measure at that time clinically with high reproducibility coefficients and variability, less than, or less than 15% was the requirement. And we basically measured various parameters of immunity, primarily cytokines uh, in, in this experiment, uh, and in patients with metastatic melanoma, which is the stage 4 bar, and this is an IL-4 concentration value, versus earlier stages of disease where tumors were resected and healthy controls. And for all those patients, we projected all of the data in, in multidimensional space, looking at principal component analysis, looking to see the natural grouping of the data. And, and PCA allows us to see, you know, per patient with multiple measurements which are presented as vectors, how would these, these data group together? And we saw a grouping of the brown balls relative to everything else, and the browns are the metastatic melanoma, and this is the IL-4 version of those measurements. And what we're able to find is that systemic immunity in patients with advanced cancer really was profoundly TH2 biased. Uh, and around this time, we also developed a uh, artificial APC method to quantify uh, sort of uh, CD8 polarity, uh, CD4 polarity, that w was able to support this finding that came out of cytokine work, suggesting that systemic immunity in advanced cancer is not normal. The reason we thought it was normal is because we the functional assays that we did required a week of culture in, in vitro. So all of, the, all of the cytokines, all the mediators, basically reprogrammed back to normal ABO serum, and, and were lost. Part of this work led to really the, the development of checkpoint inhibition, arguing that these systems were set up in a, in, a, in a way that systemic immunity was regulated at the behalf of the cancer. So how do we put all this together? Remember, there's hundreds of molecules of regulated immunity. You know, PD-1 inhibitors, CTLA-4 inhibitors are only, only small numbers of that. And the, the, the unfortunate thing is, is these hundreds of immune regulatory molecules are not fixed in concentration. And so this was a, because just as I thought I had solved the problem, <laughs> uh, I realized that measurements that I did on a Tuesday were different on a Wednesday, then on a Thursday, then on a Friday, then on a Saturday, then on a Sunday, then on a Monday. Okay? So that's CRP. How about IL-12 P70? You know, we would probably, you know, that's a cytokine that is pretty much clear at TH1. And IL-1 RA, pretty much a shutoff switch on everything. So look at the oscillatory properties. And this is, uh, you know, these, these are uh, curve-fitted to an extent. And they seem to oscillate at opposite phase of each other. So there went that plan. You know, because most clinical trials, we take sort of a blood sample before, then we do something horrific, horrific to these patients. And then three weeks later, we check it again. 
as we were trying to sort of compartmentalize the, the problem of systemic community and its regulation, you know, one, you know, one of your current colleagues and my former graduate student said, you know, well, what if these things change over time? And it turns out they did. So what do we do with this? So, so which value do I use as the baseline to my comparison three weeks afterwards? You know, which day would you like me to see me? And based on that availability, I will have a publishable versus unpublishable result. Let me just worry about the, <laughs> some of the things we do here. Uh, and trust me, this is not a popular discussion at a study section <laughs> when, when this is brought up. But it turns out in, 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 in every sort of, uh, I kind of agonize, we wake up in a, a sweat, you know, the, in the middle of the night, you know, and sort of you know, tell my children, oh my God, we're going to have to sell the house, and I don't know what I'm doing anymore. It's all going, you know, I'm going to have to learn genetics, you know, <laughs> genomics. Well, it turns out, you know, there is some value in, in, in parameters oscillating. The problem is, you know, when I was, I was in, in graduate school, you know, all I knew was st student t-tests and, you know, Wilcoxian rank sum and all those, those things, you guys, you know, which you take a dot here, a dot there, you know, some, some, you know, value and it's statistically significant. Well, if you look at this and you say, say to yourself, well, what if, I mean, this looks like a wavelength, right? It looks like a waveform. So I'm a big sci-fi fan, you know, Star Wars, you know, my kids all had, you know, Darth Vader diapers, all kind of thing. So I asked myself, I said, you know, what if this was, if it, could this be a signal of IL-12 that is temporally variable that oscillates around a certain, uh, certain homeostatic state that required up and down regulation that is also controlled or helped controlled by another signal which is IL-1RA, and then amplify that by, you know, the 11, 1,200 different soluble molecules that regulate the meaning that we have. And could one understand the relationship between the various parameters we're looking at by understanding how they relate to each other? You know, could we understand what sustains the heavily TH2 bias cancer-promoting phenotype of systemic community that sustains cancer by understanding how these things actually talk to each other and support each other. And would there be a way to do that? Is, there, is, is this even knowable? You know, I mean, I certainly didn't know. And it turns out that temporal variability has a method called signal analysis, an analytical method in applied mathematics referred to signal analysis, which allows you to reverse engineer the interparametric dependencies and relationships, the weights of who controls whom, by looking at a multitude of these interactions in over a short period of time. And what we basically are doing now is we're measuring the effect, which is signal one, and we can reverse engineer to cause, which is the what parameter of what we're measuring is most closely approximating those changes. We can also begin to look at the modulator. So cause, we measure the effect, we reverse engineer for cause and modulator, and then potentially go back further and further and further into the cause as the number of parameters we test becomes real. And the only place on Earth that can actually do this is, as you heard, my, my friends at Goddard uh, Space Station, who are, uh, the, these are the, the engineers of the unmanned spaceflight program uh, that are the world's experts in signal analysis. And these are the people that analyze Voyager, these are the people that understand black holes and event horizons. All those things I have no idea. It took us about a year to understand we were both speaking English, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but the nice thing about that is that as of hopefully this fall, uh, we will have connected uh, this type of analysis, a multi-dimensional analysis of signal, of continued uh, variable measurement uh, with weighted interactions, and be able to project those interactions among cells within a cytoscape, uh, so we're, we're building the interface with cytoscape, so you can actually see uh, how the human immune system in cancer and health regulates each other on a systemic way to hopefully be able to glean from that places where we can intervene. And in this, you can envision this big network where we can, in silico, turn different nodes of interaction off and then read how the network will respond and the first target of this treatment and the first real test of this will be anti-PD-1 therapy in my patients that I treat with cancer, where I can predict what the PD-1 inhibition in the system will be, and I can read out the outcome.
But if we can do that, all of a sudden we now have the ability uh, to see the systemic regulation of, of cancer. So dissolve the self so, you know, in many ways, you know, I, I always, I always keep coming back to these things. Is you know, it can't be that a single mutation in BRAF gene can cause cancer and kill somebody. You know, we've been treating cancer, you know, since since Nixon was president. Uh, and I'll leave that reference. <laughs> yeah, that kind of came out wrong. So, so. so so does all of this sound familiar? I mean, you know, how is it possible that a tiny little melanoma cell with an upregulation of this, you know, this valine that goes in the wrong place in position 600 of the BRAF gene, how is this all responsible for me going to funerals, you know, two to three times a month for these wonderful people that I do everything? And I'm a reasonably intelligent guy. I, I try to save these people's lives, but I can't. So when we were doing all this immunity stuff and we were starting to see this, oh, this is the complexity of all of this was bigger but not unknowable. You know, this, this, we, could process, we could understand this, but it was much more, much more involved than whether the, NK, whether the T cells are there or not there. You know, one of my postdocs at the time was pregnant. And we're talking about this, breaking our, you know, scratching her heads, and she's still pregnant. She's not eating, you know, she's... Or, or she's eating, and she's, she needs to go to the bathroom, and we're, we're still worrying about this. She's still there. She used to have sort of a little bit of arthritis before she got pregnant. Arthritis got better. She's still there. We're looking at her. She's presenting her data. And then somebody said, you know, fetal maternal tolerance is a thing. I'm like, yeah. So we draw her blood, you know. I don't think we told the IRB that. Uh, and lo and behold... Her blood looks exactly like the 17 freezers of plasma that I have for patients with metastatic melanoma, showing the exact same profile of immune regulation of cytokine cells, you name it. When we looked at this in greater detail, we looked at all of the genes that are known to be upregulated in placenta that the, the people in this field publish to be significantly relevant in allowing placentation to work, a haploidentical graft, essentially, <laughs> which is the baby to the mom to survive, 90% of the genes doing expression arrays, this is back in the AFI, AFI days, uh, were present, active, working in ground-up tissues of metastatic malignant melanoma. So what was the reason we haven't cured cancer folks is because the tumor has co-opted regulatory mechanisms in the genome that allow for the existence of species for the placentation. That's the problem in cancer, is we're fighting not a single valine mutation. We are fighting an entire system of the body that protects the malignancy from what we do. So I go into my depression again, you know, start drinking Diet Coke from Diet Pepsi, you know. <laughs> uh, and then my postdoc has a baby. Everybody's happy, beautiful baby girl. She starts complaining of pain again in her knees. And, What's that? So we start longitudinally studying pregnancy and immunoregulation of placentation now that half of my lab has all learned everything that's ever been written about fetal maternal tolerance because that's all we're talking about. And we're a cancer lab. Well, it turns out that the Th1, Th2 balance, which is what we found to be fundamentally uh, problematic with, with cancer being Th2 balance, patients with malignant disorders proceed from a state of normal of Th1 to Th2 malignancy uh, with until death. But what's fascinating about human pregnancy, and there's really no model for this. I mean, the model is sheep. So, you know, I'm not sure I could ever be funded to do sheep research. But, uh, but you know, what happens in, in human pregnancy is around the, the second half of the second trimester, the, 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 sort of the, the population of signals, primarily cytokines and cells, begin to shift from heavily Th2 bias back to Th1, basically recapitulating normal immunity. And the question is, what in the world is happening that is systematically shifting this immune regulation at this time back to normalcy? And the question for us is, if we could understand this in the nine months of a pregnancy, can we understand how to turn the, now the, the, not, not, not just a single molecule, but what is the armada of, of signals controlling cancer immunity 
away from oblivion, which is cancer, back to normal and potentially reject the tumor. So I'm happy to report we have two potential candidates. Uh, one is galactin 9, uh, which seems to be a key down regulatory molecule that fights this. And the other one is soluble cell-free DNAs that come from the placenta. They're between 30 and 300 base pair long, heavily AT rich, that seem to be not agonists on the monocyte side. Uh, I'm not even going to go do We've published on this. Basically, it's a galactin 1 story. Patients with metastatic melanoma do poorly if they have uh, galactin levels that are high versus galactin levels that are low. Uh, galactin is expressed in the exact same features as PDL1. It, it acts on monocytes. And, and in a summary, what it basically does, galactin 9, which is heavily, heavily present in placenta in the syncytial trophoblast, uh, drives a Th2 signal, drives M2 macrophages to make VEGF and make tumors grow, blocks Th1 cells by directly causing apoptosis. Uh, and expands every size and shape of regulatory T cells. And in about two months, thanks to Dr. Janeth uh, Pynum here at the, at the university, uh, we've developed a humanized monoclonal antibody to, to target this. So hopefully in about, uh, by the end of this year, we'll be taking this into a, into a clinical trial uh, to target this. So that's kind of where, where a lot of that, that immunology sort of, sort of is right now. And, you know, as, as, as our lab is doing this and we're sort of learning all these things and you know, these nanoparticles and we do all these, all these other things, we said, well, there's this whole population of, of cancer drugs out there that exist that cost pennies on the dollar. You know, the one, I don't know how many of you realize that, you know, cancer, chemotherapy of cancer, the reason we cycle therapy or there are maximal doses of treatments that we give, uh, all of that is a function of the side effect of chemotherapy, which is suppression of immunity. We wipe out the, the, the neutrophils, we wipe, wipe out platelets. We can only give so much so we don't completely destroy the bone marrow. So in a weird sort of way, all of chemotherapy really affects immunity much more reproducibly and reliably than it ever affected cancer. So the question is, you know, talk about anathema. You know, I, I gave this at, at, at the National Chemotherapy Foundation talk, and uh, didn't go over very well. So, you know, but so I said, well, okay, you guys, you know, how about, there's a lot of old drugs. We, we're developing all these systems to study immunologic agents that we, we think we know how they work, and we try to validate them. Can we take advantage of a lot of these good, good drugs that are too toxic for normal tissues but maybe we can direct them in such a way that they can hit what we want them to hit using immunology techniques and tools that we've acquired over the years uh, and make more, more sense out of them. And could we still use these agents, deliver them to tumors, and not all expose normal tissues? Uh, and can we achieve some of the benefits of you know, toxicity, uh, cell death-induced uh, signals uh, by targeting only malignant? So our first project in this, and this was about now probably 20, 2014 when we first said this, is, well, there is, there's a drug in, in clinical practice called Abraxane. It's NAB Paclitaxel. It's essentially uh, Paclitaxel, uh, as you guys I'm sure know, is a highly hydrophobic agent. It's from the yew tree uh, bark. Uh, it's a very, bless you, it's a very, very potent uh, sort of uh, disruptor of, teeth, of cancer cell proliferation. Um, and it's normally given in a, a version of peanut oil because it's so hydrophobic and given intravenously. And these patients have all sorts of fevers, chills, all sorts of horrible things happening to them. Uh, so there was a, a recently, about 20, 2005, this drug came out. And it's basically a paclitaxel packaged within an albumin core. So it's a small nanoparticle. And in the lab, we were starting extracellular vesicles, you know, EVs. We had all the instruments to do sort of nano something or another. And we said, well, there's an albumin. We, we did a kind of a couple of real simple chemistry tests on this, and we found that many of the albumins were not saturated uh, with, uh, with paclitaxel. And we said, well, could we potentially attach uh, an antibody to this? Now, you know, I teach in our immunology course, and, and, you know, I think one of the first things I tell our students is, you know, immunoglobulins don't attach to albumins, silly. You know, that's, what do you think? Have you not read Janeway, you know? 
Well, but it turns out that the, the, the albumin that is used to package paclitaxel is not normal albumin, and monoclonal antibodies used to treat diseases are not normal antibodies. And what we were able to do is we, we asked the question is, could we tag, could we coat these albumins uh, with monoclonal antibodies by engineering hydrophobic binding sites on both the albumin and on the, on the FC portion of the immunoglobulins, and basically use the, the sort of the, the sensory elements of the antibody and carry this big chunk of payload of albumin behind it uh, to deliver into the targets that we want to kill it. So use chemotherapy to kill cancer, but not kill the immune system, and so that we have a chance to work on the immune system and have it work for us to fight cancer. So we did, uh, two, I'll give you two examples. Uh, AB160, it's a Braxine Bevacizumab, 160 nanometer sized particle. The second one is a, a Braxine Rituximab, uh, it's an anti-CD20 targeting monoclonal antibody. This is an anti-VEGF targeting monoclonal antibody, uh, both of the same size. And this is basically what we did. Uh, you know, VEGF, vascular through a growth factor, is a HIF1-induced, uh, HIF1-alpha-induced mediator of angiogenesis. Uh, hypoxic tumors need more blood vessels. They make a lot of VEGF. VEGF pulls this in about 15 years ago. This was all the rage. Uh, what we basically did is we took uh, bevacizumab nanoparticle, uh, we uh, played with a little chemistry uh, on there, sort of opened up uh, uh, the Supplo 2 site. I had a postdoc who was a structural chemist, which is very helpful. I learned a lot of structural chemistry uh, from them. Uh, and we were able to basically load about 700, uh, 6 to 700 uh, outwardly uh, facing uh, uh, immunoglobulin molecules of, of, of Aston uh, on these Abraxan molecules that, when broke down, broke down into these 200 kilodalton moieties which were the antibody, one molecule of albumin attached to them, and paclitaxel. And, you know, did EM on them so they look like uh, basically four-fifths of the surface area uh, of the Abraxian is coated with the antibodies, and this is just a kind of scanning EM picture. I think this was our lab's Christmas part, uh, card several years ago. Um, you know, we, we can make these molecules different sizes by varying the, the relative concentrations of these things, and, you know, this is sort of just the uh, size uh, descriptions. Uh, we tested uh, these things uh, for ability to bind a VEGF uh, and for ability to kill proliferation against a Braxane. Uh, this is A375 cells in, in, in vitro. Uh, the pro anti proliferative effect of the drug is not impeded by the coating of, of, with, the with the monoclonal antibody, nor is the binding of uh, VEGF uh, to bevacizumab impeded by the association with, the, with the, uh, a Braxane. We did some mouse experiments, you know, uh, I can still do this. Uh, we gave some uh, nude mice, A375 melanoma, let the tumors grow to a given size, and then treat single shot with uh, these controls. This is a complex. This is the two drugs given separately, bevacizumab, abraxin, alone, saline. And what we found is that, that, you know, the animals that were treated with the complex molecule, of AB160, uh, did the best. Uh, took this into a phase one clinical trial. I was fortunate to, uh, to, to get a grant on this. Uh, and we did a study in, Mel oh, this is still a study still ongoing, dose escalation phase one clinical trial, kind of real sort of boring stuff, just kind of trying to find out what dose will actually work. Uh, and uh, we basically, so far, treated 12 patients. Uh, the average time to disease progression on these patients equals that of the PD-1 inhibitors in clinical practice today. So we took a completely ineffective drug, which is a Braxane in melanoma, and we allowed delay in tumor growth for approximately eight months in these patients, for pennies on the dollar for what we did and a little bit of chemistry in the lab. This was so successful, we've now opened a ovarian cancer trial and have since spun out a, a pharmaceutical company out of our lab to do this because we found very similar results with uh, anti-CD20. This is a lymphoma targeting strategy. Uh, the same drug, Abraxane, uh, now coated with a different antibody towards a different cancer target. Uh, and this is uh, biodistribution, this is sort of a, uh, in, in vivo fluorescence imaging. And you can see just basically the point here is that the AR160 molecule, the, the, it's a fluorescently labeled Abraxane. The A is fluorescently labeled. And, you know, they're red because uh, the fluorescence is widely distributed as the drug circulates uh, and it concentrates in the tumors. 
and the, we can actually block the concentration of the drug with rituximab alone, suggesting specificity. So it's a, we've effectively changed the biodistribution, the pharmacokinetics of abraxane by tagging on a guidance system on the drug. So this, is, uh, this was recently approved by the FDA to go into phase one clinical trial in lymphoma. And encouraged by this, we basically started working with abraxane. We've made uh, bevacizumab, which is now in metastatic melanoma and ovarian cancer. We've got the rituximab molecule for non-Hodgkin's non non lymphoma. We're having, we've made one for trastuzumab for breast cancer, cetuximab for head and neck cancer, atezolizumab for PDL one and we've made OKT3 for T-cell lymphomas. We've also added multiple different cancer drugs onto the albumin nanoparticle so we can actually do two and three different chemo drugs loaded on this particle. Plus, we've also created a non-toxic uh, nanoparticle uh, that can be, that we can load multiple antibodies. It's potentially, potentially, this experiment's getting read out this Friday. You know, can we actually finally create an artificial antigen presenting cell where we have a class one molecule with a peptide loaded in it with CD28 that is stable enough not to release the CD28 until the interaction signal two is engaged and basically present, you know, go do what the dendritic cell world has so tried to do, me included in the late 90s or 2000s. Can we create a artificial antigen presenting cell that will not succumb to the counter-regulatory signals that I've shared with you in cancer and simply be able to drive an immune response. And I won't talk about new antigen discovery because I think you guys need other things to do today, but listen to me. So in summary, you know, all, all I've, what I've hoped, hoped I've done is sort of give you, you know, sort of the, the reason we do this uh, in our lab, in our program, you know, in our group is, you know, we, we want to really have meaningful clinical outcomes. It's God forbid any one of you in this room ever suffers from this diagnosis, you know, you'd want somebody like me on the other side trying to help you, help you through it. Uh, the nice thing about our program is it truly is an interdisciplinary. And I, I think, you know, for, 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 the, for the younger audience in the crowd, I think those of us <laughs> with some gray hair appreciate this. But I think two heads are always better than one. And I can tell you from personal experience, you know, I love it when I'm the guy in the room that knows the least about the problem we're discussing. And I've, you know, I've gone to everywhere, to, you know, I've cold called, you know, NASA asking for help. <laughs> so, you know, it, it is amazing how much, you know, enthusiasm and help exists out there in the world. If, if you want help, help will be given to you, you know, like in Hogwarts, right? Anybody? Uh -huh. Oh God, you guys, it's too early. Have some coffee. All right. And, and, you know, and finally, you know, I, I worked at, at a nice place. I certainly wish that we had a building like yours, but, you know, man, is okay, too. Uh, and, you know, uh, we have the, uh, you know, we're, we're, Mayo is a nice place to work in. You know, I think a few years ago we got the Stand Up to Cancer Melanoma Dream Team Award. So we're, you know, we do do genomics only. You know, I, I don't happen to do it, but members of our team do. Uh, we have the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center, the immunotherapy program that has been very supportive of, of the work I've done over the years. The Center for uh, Translation Research, uh, where a lot of our students in the graduate school come from. And several years ago, you know, we felt that, you know, the, the, the work that we're doing needs to benefit, needs to be disseminated faster than what the current uh, structure and government allows us to do that. So we've created the Midwest Melanoma Partnership, 20 institutions that feel as motivated about putting a stop to cancer as, as I do. And, None of, none of this would ever be done if it's not for a, a, a small group of highly motivated people, which is, which is our lab. And this is us from our uh, Christmas party. I think I'm going to have to get a bigger house next year. Anyway, with that, uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I'll entertain any questions. Who wants to go first? There's no exam. You know, you can ask me about, you know, Kamagura polynomials. I'll, I'll tell you exactly how much I know about it. It's nothing. So. <laughs> Hi, that was a great talk. I wanted to tell a little story before I ask my question. So I post doc at Mayo from 03 to 08. I remember I was hosting a speaker from US, uh, UCSD, and he said to me over breakfast, Scott, I'm really worried that I'm underdressed for my visit tomorrow. <laughs> 
my, my question was, I was fascinated by the oscillatory nature of the cytokines and receptors that you showed. Do you think that there might be opportunity for uh, oscillatory deployment of therapies, particularly immune therapies? Exactly. So to be honest with you, what's, what's interesting about it, so we were, we actually had a funded grant, and then CTLA-4 got published. The New England Journal published this paper, and I had a grant just prior to that, ready to open, that we had to, I, I ethically couldn't do the study, uh, that looked at a drug called temozolomide, which is an oral agent that preferentially depletes CD4 cells. It's active in melanoma, but has an unusual side effect of knocking down CD4 cells. And our idea was, you know, could we potentially at the, at, at the apex of the CD4 cells deliver a drug, drug that would deplete them, therefore forcing the, the, the balance of scales to go into CD, sort of, uh, I'm sorry, it's a depletion, what we believed would be CD4 and then Tregs from there, and de depleting those and sort of forcing a positive outcome to immunity. Uh, and we, we, we had done a small study that was, was never published, a pilot study, where we showed that the biology of something like this would work if I gave it at the trough versus the peak of the CD4s, and we just measured, and then it took us two years to develop a predictive model as, for instance, you know, if, if it goes like this, can I predict where the peak will be uh, a week ahead? And then we, we had all this thing figured out, planned to tell the patients when to take it. Uh, and the unique thing about that drug is it has a 24-hour, 22-hour half-life, so it would potentially cover that peak. Uh, the oscillatory rhythm of the, of the T helper cells were anywhere between three and four days. So we, we could potentially have like a great way to do that, but you know, we, uh, we, we never got a chance to study it. The monoclonal antibodies have a very long half-life. So to be honest with you, I'm not sure that would work. Uh, but recent publications have suggested that the use of cytotoxic agents uh, are, is, is okay to be do done in combination with chemotherapy. Uh, and I, I basically have that trial. We are right now are sort of, you know, cleaning off the dust of it and saying, you know, can we, can we do exactly that? Because the, 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 these dynamics are telling us something. I'm not exactly sure what, and I'm not sure if a blunt instrument like a pill will be sufficient to do it. But I have data that it changes the immune environment in a dramatic way. Uh, if given on one day versus another, can we clinically apply it? I'm hoping to be able to answer that next year. Sorry. So uh, along those same lines and what you said about, you know, chemotherapy is immune suppressive, right? Yeah. But we think we need it to be bulk, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then now we're learning that the most effective way to control many cancers is bolster the immune system and not to put it down. So, you know, do you see a a future where we would start with immune therapies or, I mean, how, how do you start? So, sorry, so the, the way I, I, I really think this will work is, is I think it's the yin and the yang. You know, there, there's, we're, we're dealing in a, in a dynamic system that is controlled by positive and negative regulators. And, and the equilibrium, the, the steady state in advanced cancer is sort of advantage cancer. Uh, and I don't think a blunt instrument of sort of wiping everything clean and restarting now. You know, that's what allowed, you guys may know uh, tumor of strain lymphocytes, the NCI has forever done this. And the only way they were able to, when we published the original sort of systemic dysregulation of immunity, that's when, you know, our, my friend Steve Rosenberg basically decided, oh no, we need to use fludarabine, which is a profoundly lymphodepleting drug. And that actually allowed the T cells to engraft. So, but that was a very, it's a very sort of blunt way of doing it. Uh, our, our effort with these nanoparticles, the only reason I got into, I mean, I don't know anything about it, any of this, you know, is, is that we, I really, we really needed to find a way to sort of surgically hit the targets we wanted to hit from the information that we were getting, and a blunt force trauma wasn't going to get us there. So I suspect that the, the solution will be being selective in what we shut down, being selective in what we turn on and potentially affect outcome with minimal toxicity, which directional therapy will allow us to do. And you think that this is gonna be enough to debulk like a large tumor? I can tell you, oh yeah, I mean, for instance, you know, I mean, uh, there's actually a dear patient of mine, uh, you know, multiple sites of metastasis everywhere. And it was, you know, she had done well for seven years, disease had gone, I put her, this is, I put her in two complete remissions. Uh, and I, I basically pulled, I said, I've got nothing for you. Uh, there's an ongoing trial at our institution that combines paclitaxel and carboplatin, uh, systemically administered, 
uh, a, a sort of indirect play on this timing, uh, and gives pembrolizumab. And within probably six weeks of treatment, 80% of her disease is reduced. So there is some combinatorial benefit here. Uh, immunity is very potent. For instance, you know, if you stop immunosuppression for a liver transplant patient that is a liver liver, that liver is gone in two weeks. I mean, you know, it is it is powerful to do this, but how we control it uh, in time and space, and I think space increasingly more important than time. I think is going to be terrific. We'll find out. So, um, I was wondering, um, you you mentioned that and emphasized that the importance of seeing things on, in a when they're acting, right, the immune complexes. You talked about technetium-99, PET scans and yes, stuff. Uh, so what's the future in 2017, looking at these immune complexes, how they work in, in humans? Right, so to be honest with you, one of the, one of the, so I would say, you know, the, when, I, when I give this talk, you know, uh, the, the analogy I always sort of like to bring out uh, is, is this. Uh, all, all cancer therapy, as is in general, if you think about sort of, you know, the, the, the mindset of the NCI from the 1970s, which, which is, probably dates back to the First World War, uh, is that more, we, if we can only give enough drugs, remember, all, all, cancer drug kill, all cancer drugs ever invented kill cancers 100% of the time in a dose-dependent fashion. The reason we can't do that in the clinic is because the concentration of the drug needs to be too high, is, is too high to, for the patient to survive for us to kill the cancer. So we do, we dose based on maximally tolerated doses, which, which in reality means less than 5% of the drug ever reaches the tumor target. Uh, you know, uh, genomically targeted, genomically informed therapeutics in the whole human genome project, all that really does is defines unique aspects of the tumors for which a compound would be toxic to the tumor but not to the rest of the body. And if, if insulin was developed by oncologists and developed, given to the maximally tolerated dose, without the ability to measure the effective dose of insulin, which is blood sugar, insulin, we would not be able to treat diabetes today. Diabetes today would be an incurable disease. So treating to a biomarker that is relevant is profoundly more effective than treating blindly to some outcome that happens months and months down the line as vis-a-vis -vis tumor progression. And so, so what, what, I, the way, what I was reasoning is, you know, could we use that analogy, that therapeutic analogy, the success of, of diabetes therapy uh, in immunotherapeutics? Because right now, we treat until there's a reason not to treat, I mean, fundamentally, until either we blow out somebody's pituitary gland, you know, desquamate their intestines, uh, or the tumor just advances. And so. At 2017, that, sh you know, that shouldn't be the standard. All conventional, and the reason I started with IL-2 is I, I wanted to do something, something that everybody agreed upon would be, you know, I mean, you know how it is. We, we do the research we can fund, and everybody agrees that TILs are important, CD8-positive cytotoxic killer T cells in the tumors that are able to kill, actually, tumor cells should all mediate IPI, PD-1, PD-L1, all of those drugs. They all work the same way. If they don't traffic in the tumor, they're not going to work. So we can be given these, two, these, these drugs you know, forever and still not going to work. So that's why I started there. But fundamentally, the, the, the chemical trick, which is how we got into protein chemistry uh, in our lab and you know, do it right now, uh, that we use to tag technetium to the IL-2, what is it, 160 uh, amino acid peptide protein, uh, can be done with any, uh, most cytokines that would bind the ligand. Antibodies won't work because they're too big. Uh, but this is sort of a small molecule ligand receptor binding interaction. So we're starting here. The technology to broaden this very rapidly and very quickly is, is available. It's just, I just need a first win to, 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 to be able to get the funding to do that. So. If there are no more questions, thank you. Thank you.